COVID-19 has brought sudden changes to the nature and frequency of our trip making and thus traffic conditions on our roads. How adaptable are we to these new situations? In one area, Australia has led the world in adaptability for transport, a system for operating traffic signals, including coordination of sites. But are we maintaining the capability to make the most of this system? The Sydney Coordinated Adaptive Traffic System, SCATS, as the name suggests, was first developed for Sydney, but has been sold around the world. There have been upgrades, and with the advent of new technologies, including methods of measuring traffic flow, there is apparently some further development considerations. But there is a concern that development should not only be based on expertise in technology, but an understanding of traffic. Alan Finlay, who was a major player in using SCATS from its early years, gives us a rundown on the core principles of its operation. We still need to adjust the system, particularly when there are huge variations to traffic volumes, but we cannot consider new developments without understanding the basics. This is a first in a series about a system that has proved the test of time for some 50 years. Further videos will look at the history of how the system developed, how to best deal with pedestrians, examples of where it doesn't seem to be working well, what data can we mine from the system, and how we might progress in the future. Coordinated, how coordinated is it? Uh, well, it's coordinated in the sense that uh, there's the possibility to connect individual sets of signals together to achieve a green wave effect, so that uh, ideally traffic that's travelling along an arterial road uh, in a heavier direction is likely to receive successive green signals and therefore minimise the number of stops. It's not uh, one that suffers the butterfly effect where that if there's a, a hiccup in Campbelltown then lights change differently in, north, you know, in the northwest. No, no. Um, SCATS has the capability of being connected uh, in fairly long strings of intersection along an arterial road or in groups of intersections in a CBD situation. But uh, in general, the uh, connected strings are not so long that um, somewhere on the other side of Sydney is going to affect something else. Mm. In fact, it should be set up uh, so that there is flexibility and that uh, that sense of coordination only occurs when it's absolutely necessary to occur. It started in the CBD. You didn't try a, a, a across-the-board system. You, it trialled early in a couple of signals. Uh, yes, it was in the 1960s that the first system was set up in the Central Business District of Sydney, uh, only about 12 intersections, but it was a very different system in that it was a fixed time system that was run from a central computer and the local controllers at each intersection were basically just slave controllers. Uh, they were very simple devices and uh, there were no push buttons and no detectors, so the central computer uh, made all of the decisions on a fairly rudimentary uh, time of day basis. Now we've got, what, then, early 70s, we started to get loop detectors. Was that a big breakthrough? Yes, it was. Um, prior to the loop detectors, uh, the sort of detectors used in New South Wales were uh, pneumatic strip detectors. So the vehicles would run over a pneumatic strip that was embedded in a channel on the road and it just counted uh, the fact that there was a pulse when a vehicle ran over the detector and that told the traffic signal controller that there was a demand for that phase and there was some rudimentary timing to determine how long the phase should run for. If there was one pulse and then a big gap, it could be only one vehicle or the fact that uh, someone's sitting there waiting. That's true. Uh, those sort of detectors uh, did not know about the presence of a vehicle sitting over them. Uh, whereas when we went to loop detectors, uh, we had two types. There was a, what they called a passage detector, which was basically the same type as the pneumatic strip. You just got an output when the vehicle went over the detector. But uh, then we fairly uh, quickly adopted presence detectors, which means that there's an output while ever there is a vehicle in the detection zone over the loop detector. And those detectors are located at the stop line, 
whereas the old type of detector was located some 30 metres upstream of the stop line. So you can now measure both when something is over the detector, but it might be a, a vehicle going slowly or someone stopped. That's right. Uh, so the, the length of the output pulse is directly proportional to the speed at which the vehicle goes over the detector. So it could be a stationary vehicle or it could be a very long vehicle uh, travelling very slowly that causes uh, a long output pulse. But one of the clever things then is you measure the gap between cars. Yes, that's right. SCATS works on measuring both the occupancy time of the loop, which is uh, when the loop is uh, activated by a vehicle in the detection zone, but it also measures the space time, which is the time between successive vehicles. And it uses both of those um, measurements to work out a degree of saturation. But there are parameters within there. You've sat above traffic in a helicopter quite a bit in, in your time, you know, adjusting things. There, it's not just a case of letting it run. There are parameters in there? Yes, that's right. There are parameters both in the local controller, which is the grey box that sits at the intersection uh, on the corner, and it does a lot of the uh, local timing uh, for the uh, individual phases. But then there's a SCATS overlay, which is a strategic sort of overlay, which determines optimum cycle times and phase times and uh, the connection between one intersection and another. And the operator has to set some outer boundaries uh, within which the system can operate. And then the system does an awful lot of its own calculation to work out what would be the optimum time settings. So it would add up the gaps between cars as well. Yes, at the, at the local level, if there's uh, successive uh, gaps between vehicles or that space time between vehicles and they exceed what is determined to be an optimal amount, then each of those exceedances gets added to an accumulation timer and eventually the controller will say there's too much wasted time going on here, we're going to terminate this phase and move to the next one. If you coordinate in one direction, what happens in the other? Yes, coordinating uh, a one-way street is uh, very simple, uh, not too many challenges in that because you know which direction the traffic's heading in and you know what the time relationship is between the successive intersections. Uh, to get good two-way coordination, uh, in, it depends a lot on the geometric spacing of the intersections. And so um, if the intersection spacing is uh, relatively uniform, uh, then you can work out an optimum cycle time or perhaps several optimum cycle times to get good two-way coordination. But in peak periods, uh, at high cycle times, it's very difficult to get good two-way coordination. Usually one direction is favoured, the heavier direction of travel will be the one that's favoured and that will be the one that gets the green wave and the opposing direction won't get such good coordination. You, what are you trying to maximise? Well, that depends. Um, it depends on the, the, the setting or the location of the signals. If the signals are in a CBD environment, um, the, the control strategy would largely be to minimise pedestrian delay and to probably provide good service for public transport vehicles such as buses. If, on the other hand, the signals are on a heavily trafficked arterial road in the suburbs, it's more likely to be a traffic uh, throughput uh, optimization strategy, which is to maximise the product of the volume times the speed of the traffic. Coordinating as a flow like down a pipe seems logical. What happens when you get turning movements entering the main main road? Yes, that's uh, that's where it becomes a bit more challenging. If you have a really heavy turning movement coming in from a side street onto the main road that's going to cause a queue at the downstream intersection and so in peak periods when you've got such heavy traffic uh, typically the, the SCATS operator would have to compensate for that by adjusting the offset uh, between those two intersections so that there is less of a, a time difference during peak periods and then it reverts to a, a more typical travel time offset outside peak periods. You have to make sure that if I get some turning phase that I've got room to turn into the, the, the capacity. You know, it's not blocked up by other people. Yes, that's particularly important when you've got very short block spacings and the Sydney CBD is a good example of that. There are, there are many streets in the CBD, the east-west streets in particular have very short block spacings and uh, therefore 
the coordination along streets like King Street and Market Street has to be spot on to make sure that when the signal turns red uh, at the downstream intersection there is still space for the vehicles that are turning in from the side streets. When you have two intersections that are very close together you have to do that sort of uh, linking them very tightly, don't you? Absolutely. The, the closer the intersection spacing, the more rigid the coordination has to be between the intersections. You've got to marry them. Yes, they, uh, they would be, in our terminology, force married. Force, force Can you divorce? Um, not under those circumstances, <laughs> but in, uh, in, in situations where the intersections are more widely spaced, uh, typically the marriages would occur subject to certain conditions such as a higher volume on the uh, on the through road or on the arterial road mm. so it's possible to have the uh, the two groups of intersections uh, join up together to form one very long group or to as we say divorce to operate separately at different cycle times so picking the parameters at different times of the day is that critical uh, yes, but we, we try not to be too didactic about uh, the times of day that these things will occur. Rather, we try and define the sorts of traffic conditions that will make these things happen. So rather than choosing, say, the morning peak period from 6.30 to 9.30, we might say that when the volume along this particular road exceeds a certain threshold, then those intersections will join up to form a much longer stream. So then, for example, on a public holiday where you don't have such heavy traffic on the main road, the operating conditions will be quite different and SCATs will automatically then adopt to those, those conditions. It's not slavishly to the time of day, but rather adaptive to the conditions? Absolutely. The whole idea of that A in SCATs means adaptive, and that means that the operator will set some outer boundaries or limitations, and within those limitations the system is free to... Uh, optimise and try and produce the best outcome uh, in accordance with the overall control strategy. We need to have a lot of hands-on experience in this. This is not a magical black box that will fix everything. The, 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 the adjustment of parameters and such, is, is that something that needs constant attention? Uh, it's not constant attention in the sense that if a system has been well set up to suit uh, the particular conditions, then uh, there shouldn't be much need for day-to-day -day intervention in terms of its operation. But from time to time there will be changes in the road network. For example, a new freeway might be constructed or there might be a change which converts a, a network of two-way streets into some one-way streets. They're the sort of things uh, that when the network changes then the SCATS operator will have to go back in and have a fresh look at the, uh, at the whole operating philosophy and make some adjustments so that it works optimally in the new road network arrangements. So ultimately with new technology, can I sit at home and, or in my office and manage these things? Uh, these days the technology is pretty good and an operator, uh, a SCATS operator could sit in the office or at home, logged into the system and um, of course we also have these days a lot more closed circuit TV cameras so um, you can actually look at the SCATS operation uh, itself um, electronically and also look at a CCTV camera which would show you what's actually happening on the road. However, I think uh, there's no excuse for actually going out on site um, and observing some of the, both the driver behaviour, the pedestrian behaviour, the cyclist behaviour, so that you get a really good understanding of what people are doing and the way they're responding to the system as it's being designed. Yeah, and um, there may be little local nuances of a, you know, a, a driveway that's nearby that can, can make a big difference. Yes, that's right. And there could be things like uh, aged care homes or uh, hospitals and other things where the speed of the pedestrians uh, is not uh, like the normal speed that's assumed in most of the time settings. Alan, thank you for your time. You're welcome, David.